Good afternoon. Welcome back to Grand Rounds today. Uh, please uh, remember to sign the attendance record at the back of the auditorium, and also please remember to fill out and uh, turn in the program evaluations. And if you could give us any ideas in regards to future topics and future speakers, we would appreciate that. Also, uh, a reminder that uh, we will not be having Grand Rounds next Wednesday or the Wednesday thereafter, but we'll reconvene in three Wednesdays. Uh, Today, I uh, have the pleasure of actually reintroducing uh, Dr. Joe Merchant. Dr. Merchant is a hematologist oncologist. He did his fellowship at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, he's been a frequent and excellent contributor here at uh, Grand Rounds today, and uh, he has graciously accepted our invitation uh, to come back and uh, complete an update on breast cancer. Uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Joe Merchant. Okay. Um, first of all, Steve, thank you very much for the introduction and for the invitation. Um, I uh, uh, learn a lot from presenting Grand Rounds and organizing a talk, and I really appreciate the opportunity to do this again. Um, I think it was last December that I did my first breast cancer update, and in that talk, I talked. I, I organized. I organized the talk by by uh, presenting a, a woman in her 20s who had breast cancer to talk about triple negative breast cancer. And I, then I presented a woman in her 30s. Um, and uh, now I'm going to move on in, in the breast cancer, uh, to, in my breast cancer update, to talk about a woman in her 40s, a woman in her 50s, and then lastly, a woman in her, in her 60s. So by way of introduction, breast cancer is, is common, as you're all aware. It causes, a, in the United States, over 40,000 deaths in 2017 and over 250,000 invasive breast cancer uh, in 2017. Um, you'll see on the left column, D DCIS accounts for about 63,000 cases. In Iowa, 2,300 new cases of breast cancer and uh, about 370 women uh, died of breast cancer in 2017. This accounts for 13% of all cancer deaths. Um, many of you, I'm sure, know or have a family member uh, who has suffered from breast cancer, so it's not, it, it, it's not an, an unusual disease. It's something we certainly take care of and take pride in, in taking care of here at Bliss Cancer Center. Um, about one-fifth of cases occur in younger women, young, less than 50. The median age, though, for breast cancer is 61. Um, this five-year survival rate for breast cancer has dramatically improved compared to the 1970s. This is all invasive breast cancers going from about 75% five-year survival up to uh, above 90% in the decade from 2000 to 2010. And I think uh, there's many reasons for this, including better, better detection. Mammograms were just getting started in the 70s. And uh, certainly mammographic technology has improved since then. But also our treatments have improved, as I hope to show in some of, some of today's talk. The number of women dying of breast cancer is still way too high, more than 40,000. Uh, about 6% of women will present with advanced or stage 4 breast cancer at the time of their diagnosis. Um, but another 30 to 40% of women who are diagnosed with early, early stage breast cancer will go on to suffer a recurrence and uh, distant metastatic disease. So this is the first patient I wanted to discuss. Um, these are uh, r sort of real patients with some adaptations. Um, uh, and, and for the purpose of uh, fitting, fitting the data that I want to present. This is a young woman, 42, who presented with uh, um, a breast lump on her own uh, that she found on her, uh, or actually, no, it was found by her primary care doctor at the time of a routine physical exam. She had a negative family history. She had um, a subsequent part of her workup, she had a panel test that showed she did not have any known inheritable mutations. She had her mammogram at the time of her exam, and that showed clusters of microcalcifications. And I think for just for my own interest, I, 
wanted to include some information. Are there any radiologists in the okay. So I'm, I'm being brave here to talk about a radiology topic, but microcalcifications are what we see on, on breast um, imaging on mammograms. These are defined as less than one mi millimeter size calcifications. Many mammograms will, that I show my patients will have lots of calcifications in the breast, but they are macro calcifications, large uh, popcorn size uh, bits of calcium in the breast. Those are not malignant, but the small calcifications, the micro calcifications are worrisome, especially when they present in clusters. And, um, and microcalcifications are present in about 30% of all breast cancers, malignant breast cancers. And if you look at breast cancers detected by mammogram, they're present in 50%. Um, I should mention uh, microcalcifications are more commonly a sign of ductal carcinoma in situ. So it, just having microcalcifications doesn't um, imply necessarily a malignancy. This is, this is just for my own review and maybe your information, some information about the anatomy of the breast. Looking at uh, the breast as, a, as an organ, it has 15 to 20 lobes, and uh, each lobes are segments. Each gives rise to a main duct that leads to the nipple. And the, um, uh, we, we often will see, the pathologist will tell us if we have a ductal cancer a ductal cancer or a lobular cancer, or sometimes a mixed ductal or lobular, mixed ductal and lobular cancer. And it's helpful for uh, women to understand what part of the breast this, their cancer started in, perhaps. So this patient um, who was found by her primary care doctor to have a lump in her breast, the primary care doctor sent for a mammogram. The mammogram suggested just a few clusters of microcalcifications but knowing that the, that the lump was distinct and different and palpable, the um, primary care doctor uh, did not choose a repeat mammogram or you know, a subsequent delay, delaying tactic, but rather went right to breast biopsy, which was very important. And uh, the patient was found to have a highly, uh, highly aggressive appearing breast cancer, um, which was HER2, three, pl three plus, ER3+, plus and PR3+, plus. I'll, I'll try to talk to what, what that means to us. Estrogen progesterone receptor um, are, are um, tested on every, excuse me, on every breast cancer, as is HER2. And these are markers that we use to both give us an idea of prognosis and to help us with treatment. This patient wanted to have breast conservation. Her breasts were not extremely large, so this was a big cancer that would have required uh, uh, um, uh, more than half of her breast to be removed. And so she and I talked about getting treatment with chemotherapy prior to surgery. This strategy is called neoadjuvant chemotherapy. So neoadjuvant chemotherapy was suggested for her, and the goal with this was to cause the cancer to completely disappear. That is, our goal was to cause a complete remission pathologic complete remission. Um, so that when the surgeon goes to operate, there would be no living cancer in the breast or in the lymph nodes in the underarm. Um, if we are able to accomplish that, um, the woman could undergo a much smaller surgery um, with better cosmetic uh, outcome and can go on to receive radiation to the breast and then adjuvant hormonal therapy afterwards. Because the patient had a HER2 positive breast cancer, and I'm going to go into that, the patient received a four drug regimen, uh, Taxotere, Carboplatin, Herceptin, and Pertuzumab. So I want to talk, use this case as an opportunity to talk about HER2 positive breast cancer. And I see Dr. Weider is here, so forgive me if um, my, I got these off the internet. So these are. Um, an, an image of uh, estrogen receptor stain, which is a nuclear stain, and the HER2, HER2, which is a surface stain. Am I right about that? That's okay. Okay, good. So this is a this is immunohistochemistry. This is what our pathologists 
help us with a great deal. And um, just as a reminder, I showed this slide in my earlier talk. There are four major molecular types of breast cancer. So uh, when women are told you have breast cancer, really it's important to know which breast cancer, which type of breast cancer do you have. We call, we, we divide them uh, luminal A, luminal B, HER2 enriched, and triple negative. And I talked about uh, triple negative at my last talk. I want to focus here on the HER2 enriched population. Many patients with HER2 positive breast cancer um, are also estrogen and progesterone receptor positive. The prognosis for HER2 uh, used to be very poor, but has dramatically improved with the development of medicines that specifically target the HER2 uh, molecule. That is because the HER2 molecule itself is a growth uh, promoting molecule. And if we interrupt the HER2 mechanism, we prevent the cancer from growing. So um, when I started, um, as an oncologist in the 90s, um, the HER2 positive breast cancer were, were, were bad breast cancers. They were, uh, it, was an, it was a misfortune to be uh, found to have HER2 positive breast cancer. But um, around that time, um, and, and certainly since then, a dramatic um, explosion of medicine brought about by um, research has um, significantly improved the prognosis of women with, with uh, HER2 positive breast cancer. So HER2 is a, a member of the human epidermal growth factor receptor family. This family has four members that are identified as HER1 through HER4. This, uh, this is a molecule that has a portion outside the cell, a portion in the cell membrane, and then an intracellular portion. And the, the um, this is a cartoon that shows um, the HER2 her one, uh, her one, her two, her three, her four. These are showing the showing the um, the molecules dimerized. Um, the, the molecules usually only dimerize in the presence of uh, of uh, the ligand. So um, when they are not dimerized, they do not transmit signal. When they are dimerized, they transmit signal, and the signal is for the cell to grow, divide to stimulate angiogenesis or the recruitment of blood vessels into the tumor. The HER2 molecules can homodimerize. They can dimerize HER1 to HER1 or HER2 to HER2, or they can heterodimerize HER1 to HER3 and, and so forth. This is a different cartoon showing the molecules which are uh, they're heterodimerized. And then this is just a lot of downstream molecular machinery that happens inside the cancer cell. And a lot of research has gone on to, for example, block uh, the cancer cell here and here and here. So there's a lot of uh, effort on our parts, for example, to block the estrogen receptor, which is acting in the nucleus, to block the HER2 molecule, and to block, for example, mTOR. So women are being subjected to multiple drugs in an effort to inter interrupt the machinery in multiple places. So just this is an old study, but something for, uh, for us to um, just reflect on where the power of HER2 targeted therapy. This is the uh, Mayo study, N N9831, 4,000 women, HER2 positive, operable breast cancer that is early breast cancer, were treated with standard chemotherapy. The drugs weren't really important, but it was standard chemotherapy with or without this monoclonal antibody called Herceptin. Herceptin, uh, was this, this trial was open to women who had lymph node involvement um, or who were high risk node negative. The study, this particular publication in 2014 was after eight, more than eight years of follow-up for all patients in the study. And it showed that the addition of Herceptin to standard chemotherapy in this group of early breast cancer patients improved the overall survival at 10 years from 75% to 84%. And this is, a, this is just a, an image showing on the left um, overall survival and on the right disease-free survival. 
And I would just ask you to keep in, in your mind those numbers, the 84% with Perceptin is the 10-year survival um, and 10-year overall survival um, compared to 75%. That's, in my world, this is a huge big deal. And when this trial was pr presented for the first time to a big auditorium of oncologists, there was a standing ovation. This is a, a, a big development. Um, so this just gives a little bit more information about the, the subgroups which benefit. Um, benefit occurred in women who are node positive, node negative in women who are estrogen receptor negative and estrogen receptor positive. The big Im important information for those who provide primary care or provide care to our, our patients uh, outside of oncology clinic in any way is that these drugs can cause cardiac dysfunction. And um, the, the Herceptin molecule, uh, Herceptin uh, patients found, were found to have a 4% risk of cardiac dysfunction. and um, the risk of death from heart disease was low at about 0.1% um, in both groups. But our patients who are on Herceptin often describe, um, I shouldn't say often, at least we have to be aware of their um, report of uh, heart failure because it does, it does occur that women will have slight or reduced, mi mild redu reduction in their heart function without getting a diagnosis of heart failure. So it can, these drugs can cause morbidity for, for the heart. So fast forward from the early 2000s, late 90s, to now um, in the early 2010s, the drug pertuzumab became uh, a subject of a lot of attention. Pertuzumab is a cousin of, of trastuzumab. They both target the same molecule. They both are monoclonal antibodies that target the HER2 molecule. This is a cartoon showing this. The trastuzumab antibody attaches to subdomain 4, the pertuzumab molecule to subdomain 2. The subdomain 2 is the one that caught that uh, is where the two HER2 molecules will dimerize. So by blocking subdomain 2, we can prevent the HER2 molecules from dimerizing. And that prevents the signal transduction uh, into the nucleus of the cell. Um, this, tr this trial was what really brought pertuzumab to um, a lot of a, a, t a doctor's attention. Um, it's called the Cleopatra study. Randomized patients with newly diagnosed metastatic breast cancer, that is patients different from my, my patient that I'm presenting, but women who had already had cancer spread, who had HER2 positive disease, they received a, a common chemo called docetaxel plus trastuzumab, which would be a reasonable uh, treatment for first-line metastatic disease, with or without the addition of pertuzumab, pertuzumab the other partner monoclonal antibody. And they were able to show a six-month improvement in progression-free survival compared to trastuzumab alone, and a 16-month improvement in overall survival. This is a big deal. This is kind of a, a long improvement for a patient with metastatic disease. And um, so this, this Cleopatra study brought the FDA to caused the FDA to approve pertuzumab plus Herceptin as an approved treatment for patients with metastatic disease. So um, when we have success, when researchers in oncology have success with a drug in metastatic patients, patients with advanced cancer, they quickly will pivot and give the drug to, uh, in a research setting, to women with early breast cancer. That is, women who have been diagnosed with the breast cancer, like my patient. And this, is, this study is the affinity study, um, which involved a large, this is a large group of women, 4,800. The women had early stage HER2 positive breast cancer, very similar to the, the Mayo study, N9831. That is, they had just been treated with surgery. They got um, Herceptin plus chemotherapy, or that is Trastuzumab plus chemotherapy, or they got Herceptin plus chemo plus Pertuzumab. 
And uh, they, they randomized patients, like in the Mayo study, that were node negative or node positive. And uh, most of the women were between the age of 40 and 64, right in the sweet spot of where um, most doctors feel chemotherapy makes the biggest difference for our patients, uh, for women who are fairly young. This study was a bit of a disappointment. Uh, there was a small improvement in overall survival, um, uh, or invasive disease-free survival in this, in this image, um, with um, four years of follow-up for women who received trastuzumab plus pertuzumab plus chemotherapy. But the difference only was detectable in women who had uh, node-positive disease, and, and the difference was small. So the improved improvement in survival was a, a di invasive disease-free survival was about 3%. If you look at the patients who had no negative disease, the, there was no difference in, um, in invasive disease-free survival for adding the monoclonal antibody, two monoclonal antibodies. So this, um, uh, the addition of pertuzumab after surgery has not been um, considered to be um, for all patients, a necess necessary um, part of the treatment. But if you have HER2 positive disease with nodes that are involved at the time of surgery, it's very common that we will give both monoclonal antibodies based on the affinity trial and some other studies. So just to show some of the side effects, and this is more for oncologists than anybody else, but if you see these patients in the emergency room, one of the things that uh, patients on pertuzumab will commonly report is diarrhea. And diarrhea um, occurs in nine, almost 10%, uh, what is diarrhea? 10 compared to about 4% with just, with just trastuzumab alone. The other thing to point out is the New York uh, class, class three or four heart failure, 0 0.6, 15 patients versus six. Um, so this is, this is where I, I just want to take a pause to talk about the influence of, uh, well, I'll, I'm sorry, I'll do it a little bit later. I'm going to talk about the heart issue for women with breast cancer because it's important. So I mentioned neoadjuvant chemotherapy for my patient. My patient received four drugs. Her treatment was based on a, um, a evidence from large research studies showing that um, women who have uh, her two positive breast cancer can be very successfully treated and, and with a high chance of achieving a complete uh, pathologic remission with uh, upfront chemotherapy followed by surgery. These are some of the indications for neoadjuvant chemotherapy in breast cancer. Um, Dr. Pogue is here, so he and I often are working out ways to achieve breast conservation or breast um, uh, surgery for um, plastic surgery. Um, and and uh, Dr. Partridge is up there too. Yep, thank you. And um, so sometimes it takes a little while to get everyone organized, so we have to begin treatment, and that can uh, allow women to achieve some um, positive momentum with their cancer first. Another indication is in women who um, have node positive disease at the time of their diagnosis, but they wish to avoid axillary, full axillary dissection. And we are able to downstage women that way um, in hopes of avoiding uh, lymphedema as a late, com late complication of breast surgery. The Neosphere study was for women with HER2 positive breast cancer only. And this is sort of a companion study to the affinity study. And in this study, the women were randomly assigned to one of four arms, that is the trastuzumab plus pertuzumab plus chemotherapy, or trastuzumab plus chemotherapy, or the two monoclonal antibodies together without chemotherapy, or um, pertuzumab alone plus chemotherapy. And they were able to show that in women who got the combined group, that is the combined antibodies, almost 50% achieved a complete um, pathologic remission, which is a very high uh, number compared to the, what we were able to achieve in these patients before. Um, there was no difference in overall survival 
but the trial was uh, too small to predict an improvement in overall survival. In other studies, pathologic complete remission um, for neoadjuvant therapy has been shown to be predictive of enhanced long-term survival. Women who are put into a complete remission with chemotherapy, then have surgery, then th complete the rest of their surgery, do seem to have a better overall long-term survival. The chance of, uh, the imp I, I should mention though, and this is for my own information as much as anything, that if you achieve a complete remission, the prognostic impact is not the same across different subtypes of breast cancer. If you have um, in group uh, E here, which is triple negative breast cancer, or group D, which is HER2 positive and estrogen receptor positive breast cancer, sorry, estrogen receptor negative breast cancer, achievement of a complete remission has, it, it's, it separates two very different paths for the patients. But if you have HER2 positive, estrogen receptor positive breast cancer, and you achieve a complete remission, your prognosis is no different than if you don't achieve a complete remission. And so women who don't achieve a complete remission but have estrogen receptor positive breast cancer still can be salvaged with anti-estrogen therapy along with all the other treatments that we bring to bear. So left ventricular dysfunction, um, I don't know if there are any cardiologists here, but um, they, the cardiologists are uh, very helpful in, in helping us with our patients. Trastuzumab, along with some other drugs we use, affect the, can clearly affect the heart. Large trials have shown that uh, class 3, 4 uh, heart failure, the most severe type, which is both, both of those are disabling, uh, occurs in about 1 in 20 patients. But we have um, less severe forms of heart failure in our up to 20% of patients. So if you add that up, nearly 25% of women being treated have uh, one form or another of, of congestive heart failure. And it's been studied that the uh, target of our mo monoclonal antibodies, Herceptin, the target, HER2, has a role to play in the homeostasis of the heart. And this is just a, a slide to show the different stages of heart failure. But um, it makes a difference to women if they have a mild limitation of activity, especially if they're young at the time they are diagnosed. They're used to being able to do whatever they want, and they find that they're climbing stairs, they're very short of breath, or that they get tired after a mildly strenuous day in a way that they aren't used to. So um, left ventricular dysfunction uh, with trastuzumab, I think for those providers who are not in oncology, you're going to see this uh, pretty often. And that's why I think it's important to uh, look in the, for us as oncologists to put the drugs in the problem list and for you you're seeing a breast cancer survivor coming in with shortness of breath to you know, look at and see what, what have they been given by us. The uh, incidence of heart failure after three years of follow-up um, was 6.6% if you receive an anthracycline, that is a drug adriamycin, plus uh, Herceptin, compared to 5.1% if we avoided the anthracycline and used Herceptin. If we use Herceptin or Trastuzumab, excuse me, in women who are older, which is very tempting because um, patients will often um, look very healthy, but if they're older, we run a much higher risk of uh, causing congestive heart failure. And um, although we uh, try to reassure ourselves by checking echocardiograms every three months and at the beginning that uh, we, we tell ourselves that if we see a change, we will stop the drug. Um, and it's true that many patients will recover their heart function uh, when we stop the drug. Uh, unfortunately, not all will. And a large number will just get a little bit better. So um, all, of, all of us as oncologists have patients who have developed just this very problem here, which is their, their um, mortality from breast cancer we give them chemotherapy here, and they have a lower mortality over time, but they're, what we give them here causes a higher risk of cardiovascular death. So we, we want to try to be aware of the fact that our patients are living 10, 20, 30 years, 
and we want to avoid causing chronic congestive heart failure and other chronic disabilities. Um, okay. I should also mention that there's a lot of research going on in prevention of, of heart damage by, by our drugs, um, use of different medicines to try to prevent uh, the damage, use of cardiac MRI has been suggested instead of uh, echocardiogram, but not, nothing has really been shown to be uh, effective as a cardiac protectant for the heart. So this is again, this is what we do. We give, peop we give people drugs, their heart function goes down during, this is during adjuvant therapy. Their heart function goes down, but they're still, a, they're still asymptomatic. They're asymptomatic. I tell them, congratulations, you're in a complete remission, but then their heart function continues to decline parallel to the normal age-related decline and they develop symptomatic uh, heart uh, condition you know, 10 years down the road. So we have to be you know, thinking about this when we're deciding and celebrating early victories with the cancer. Of course, women uh, understandably don't want to die of their cancer. Um, so this patient did achieve a complete, res my patient went into a complete remission. Um, her nodes were negative, her breast was negative, the, there was no, no viable cancer found. She tolerated the treatment well. She did not develop heart failure yet. She has um, uh, been on tamoxifen now, hormonal therapy. She received breast radiation, and she's done very well. Um, so her two positive breast cancer, just a, a brief run through that. I want to shift gears, talk about another patient, um, the patient this patient is about a decade older, 52, and she um, was diagnosed, um, uh, had been diagnosed about two years earlier, and she came for a visit complaining of abdominal pain and bloating. So this is a patient I was following. She had been diagnosed uh, with BRCA1 mutation at the time of her pres original presentation. She underwent bilateral mastectomy. She underwent removal of tubes and ovaries. And she was treated at the time of her diagnosis with um, strong chemotherapy, uh, which was apparently effective uh, for the first two years. Her cancer was triple negative, estrogen, progesterone negative, and HER2 negative. She came again with abdominal bloating, and this is what we found on a CAT scan. Her liver, um, as you can see here, is markedly enlarged. Uh, it's not supposed to be that big. and all these uh, tumors inside the liver um, were found. This was uh, a presentation with metastatic, um, metastatic breast cancer. So this gives me an opportunity just to talk about a new class of medicine called PARP inhibitors. PARP inhibitors are um, extremely important for women with BRCA1 and 2 mutant breast cancers. Uh, it used to be that we would tell women, well, you should, you should have genetic testing so that your kids and your nieces and nephews and your extended family can know whether they also have BRCA uh, in the family and they can have preventative services tailored to them. Um, but now, both for breast and ovarian cancer, we have drugs that specifically are tailor-made to treat the cancer in the setting of BRCA, whereas they don't work uh, very much in women who have breast cancer who don't have the BRCA mutation. I talked about BRCA mutant breast cancer in my first talk, but I just want to talk about this a little bit um, because the PARP inhibitors are, um, it's kind of cool biology. Uh, women who have BRCA mutant mutations have a defect in homologous recombination. Um, cancers who arise, which arise in BRCA mutant patients, are dependent on alternative methods to repair their DNA. In this case, they're extremely dependent on this enzyme called PARP. PARP um, fixes the DNA for the cancer so that the cancer can, can grow and, and survive. 
BRCA cancer is about 5% or 1 in 20 of all breast cancers. Um, most uh, commonly found in women with strong family histories, uh, especially in certain ethnic groups. Women with BRCA1 often have triple negative breast cancer. Women with BRCA2 often have estrogen receptor positive disease, slightly older patient group. BRCA1 and 2 are tumor suppressor genes. Women inherit a one defective copy, and then over the course of their life, they develop a somatic mutation in the other copy, and that causes the development of cancer. If we, in women with breast cancer and BRCA, if we block PARP, we cause the cancer cells to die because they accumulate irre irre irreparable DNA damage. This mechanism of action for PARP inhibitors has been called synthetic lethality, which is kind of a cool, cool way to tell your patient that they're being treated. But in any case, the, this trial, um, Olympiad trial, is just an example of one of many trials for PARP inhibitors that have brought these drugs into development. The Olympiad trial is for a drug, Ol Olaparib, and in this trial, women had to have metastatic breast cancer. They had to have had no prior than two, no more than two prior therapies, and they were given Olaparib compared to placebo, or sorry, Olaparib compared to investigator's choice of an alternate chemo. Um, Olaparib has been shown to extend life and produce responses in about two-thirds of women, and it was approved in January of this year for treatment of metastatic HER2 negative BRCA mutant breast cancer. The side effects of Olaparib, um, aside from causing nausea and vomiting in some patients, 58% um, for example, nausea, it also causes a great deal of uh, low blood counts. So this isn't as, it isn't an easy drug to take, but it's an effective medicine. Um, it's given by itself. It's a pill. It's not a chemotherapy. It just does this one thing that causes the cancer cells to die. Um, the Embraca trial is for talazoparib, uh, uh, another PARP inhibitor. In this case, uh, the trial allowed a more heavily pretreated patients. The, it also extended survival, produced responses, um, and um, in patients with talisoparib, the uh, let's see. Well, um, it was a, just another effective drug for a BRCA positive breast cancer in the metastatic setting. What these drugs are now doing is they're being used earlier in the treatment of breast cancer, so women who have uh, perhaps never been treated in metastatic disease or who have had one prior therapy. And there's also a lot of research looking at the PARP inhibitors to um, combine with certain chemotherapies that also damage DNA. Another area where PARP inhibitors are being looked at is in combination with radiation therapy, which is a DNA damaging uh, treatment, obviously. Okay. I'm going to skip through that in the interest of time. I want to get to patient three. Um, so patient three is a patient with, who is a little older, 61. She presented with a very large breast cancer that involved the majority of her breast and seven out of 19 nodes. She was treated um, at the time of her diagnosis with mastectomy and lymph no axillary lymph node dissection followed by chemotherapy, chest wall radiation, and initiation of hormonal therapy with a drug called letrozole. Uh, she was, um, ha she had to stop the letrozole seven years later because she developed a compression fracture from osteoporosis. And um, about a year after stopping the let letrozole, she developed um, recurrent cancer. This is her bone scan. Um, she had cancer in multiple sites in her in her skeleton in her in her pelvis, in her back, in her ribs. She was in pain. So HER2 positive, or sorry, hormone receptor positive metastatic breast cancer is the topic for this patient. That is women who have cancers that express hormone receptor, estrogen and progesterone, 
These are luminal A or luminal B cancers in that original table. This is the majority of women with breast cancer. And uh, most, most women with hormone receptor positive breast cancer have, uh, can be fairly told that they have an excellent survival. This woman had a very large cancer with multiple nodes. So because of those factors, she had a poor prognosis, and she had been treated more aggressively in an attempt to prevent recurrence. She suffered one of the common side effects of hormonal therapy, that is osteoporosis, and in her case, osteoporotic fracture, and had a pause in her treatment, and she very quickly demonstrated that she had metastatic disease. The drugs that I want to talk about here briefly are the CDK4-6 inhibitors. CDK4-6 inhibitors, and these are drugs you're going to see if you're following our patients that you're going to see on their list more and more, palbocyclib, abemocyclib, ribocyclib. Um, and because these women tend to live a very long time on these drugs, you're going to see, you're going to see uh, these drugs in our patients for the foreseeable future. Um, this is just a brief uh, timeline of hormonal therapy for breast cancer, starting with blepharectomy way back in 1896, and going on to in incorporate uh, tamoxifen, 1977, immunohistochemistry for ER aromatase inhibitors, and now here in 2015, the development of CDK4-6 inhibitors. I'm not going to spend too much time on tamoxifen, but I did include a, 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 a slide about it, it's just because there are a lot of women on tamoxifen out there, and um, I thought it would be useful to include that. Also, the aromatase inhibitors, um, anastrozole, letrozole, or exemestane. These drugs um, are, are also common and have a lot of side effects that are managed by our partners. Um, including osteoporosis, fractures, um, arthralgias, musculoskeletal pain, sexual dysfunction, and cardiovascular disease. Another area where we interact or intersect with the cardiologists. This just is a very busy slide showing what we could accomplish in patients with uh, aromatase inhibitors and standard, um, uh, standard hormonal therapy and the median, progress, oops, sorry, median progression-free survivals on hormonal therapy alone are in the range of 9 to 11 months. And uh, that's, that, that was pretty good. So we had some patients that would live a lot longer than that. CDK4-6 inhibitors combine with the hormonal therapies that we've had available, like uh, anastrozole or letrozole. They combine together with the CD4-6 inhibitors, and they just blow away in terms of quality of response and length of life. Uh, they blow away what we could achieve before. One of the reasons for this is the CDK4-6 inhibitors, which are uh, uh, inhibitors of a process in cell division uh, that allows for escape from hormonal control of breast cancer. We can inhibit that process. We can prevent cancers from becoming resistant to hormonal therapy. The PALOMA-2 trial involved, uh, was one of the first that were published, involved um, studying palbocyclib or Ibrance. You'll see these drugs advertised on TV. Uh, this involved women who had luminal A, luminal B breast cancer, and they were treated, um, about half had visceral disease, that is metastatic disease to lung or liver, and about a third um, had newly diagnosed, uh, a newly diagnosed advanced cancer, whereas about two-thirds had recurred after one, after prior systemic therapy. The primary endpoint was progression-free survival, secondary endpoint overall survival. And in this case, the progression-free survival with the I addition of uh, palbocyclib or Ibrance was 10 months longer, 25 months compared to 14 and a half months. These are the survival curves showing the benefit in terms of um, progression-free survival going out uh, to 33 months. And the adverse events are important that I cover those because 
you're going to see these vibrants um, or palbociclib causes neutropenia in a pretty high number of patients. Their patients develop neutropenia rather severe in some cases with neutrophil counts very comparable to what we see on chemotherapy. But the neutropenic fever, the neutropenic infection rate is only one in one and a half percent. So the um, take home about the halbocyclib or CDK4-6 inhibitor is they cause uh, some side effects that are similar to chemo, but because they don't cause mucosal injury like chemo does, chemo will affect the lining of our mouth, the lining of our gut, um, these drugs don't do that, and so therefore they don't cause neutropenic fever, they don't cause the type of infections that we typically see with chemotherapy patients. And so while we see them neutropenic and we worry about that, we, we, are, we have the luxury of just adjusting the dose and continuing patients on their treatment. Um, the Monarch 3 trial, which is a, a competitor to palbociclib, involves abemocyclib, and it was a very similar trial to the um, earlier study that I presented. In this, in this case, um, the progression-free survival was, again, very long in the range of 25 months. Diarrhea, though, was the most common side effect here. Abemocyclib has a slightly different side effect profile. Women who are put on abemocyclib do not develop neutropenia, but do develop significant diarrhea, and they have to be reassured that it will get better, and it does usually get better after a month or two. Here is the progression-free survival with the uh, abemocyclib. I want to close just by, um, by way of emphasizing some changes in our staging system for breast cancer. Um, the staging system the, uh, uh, that is used for all cancers is, is sort of an international system, and it's updated regularly as more information is derived that shows a better way to risk stratify patients, that is, to show who is likely to survive um, longer, who's likely to have a shorter survival. And that's how they want, to, want us to group patients for the purpose of staging. And for the first time in breast cancer, um, we've got something called a prognostic staging system, as opposed to the old anatomic staging system. The reason this is important is that no longer are we limited in telling women what their stage is by whether this, what the size of the tumor was or what the um, number of lymph nodes were involved, but we're encouraged to use DNA studies that predict survival, for example, uh, oncotype scoring and um, similar, similar studies that, are that tell us this is a woman who has a very good prognosis, even though she has three positive nodes or a large tumor, her tumor is unlikely to metastasize, and therefore she should be considered as a lower stage and not a higher stage, or vice versa, women who have a very aggressive triple negative breast cancer, HER2 positive, um, even though it's small and node negative, may be considered to be a higher stage. So the staging system now has um, both an anatomic stage and a, and a prognostic stage. And um, I guess without going into all the finer points of that, I just want to emphasize that because you'll see a patient you send to us maybe with a five centimeter tumor we may tell you they're a stage one tumor, and you may say, that doesn't sound right. But that's the new, that's the new staging, the new anatomic staging system. And um, so just bear with us. It will change again in a few years. So um, that's one, one thing for, for sure. So with that, um, I think that's my, almost my last slide. I think it's just about time to stop. So any questions? Yeah, go ahead, Jim. Fantastic talk. I really appreciate all that. Um, so in like 1984, I started making monoclonal antibodies for my dad in his lab with rabbits. <clears throat> and he told me the rabbits one day were going to cure us all of cancer. And then I told him I wanted to be a surgeon. And he said, that's stupid because I told you the rabbits. So predict the future for me better than my dad. When will we stop doing surgery for breast cancer and just do 
chemo or antibodies? Yeah, I don't think, thanks, that's a good question. Um, you know, I think the, the um, I think there, there probably is, all, I mean, there's never going to be a point we get away from surgery. I mean, I, the foundation of our treatment is surgery. Um, there, there probably are going to be situations where in the future we rely on drugs um, heavily to minimize surgery. But I, don't, I guess I must, maybe I'm too old-fashioned, but I, I can't imagine getting away from surgery entirely. What you're going to have, though, is patients delivered to you with uh, different conundrums, like what am I going to do? Where's the cancer? Where was the cancer? I can't feel it anymore. What part of the breast do I take out? Um, and um, and there are more women who are wondering, I think, talking and uh, hearing on the news, maybe this could be treated without surgery, ductal carcinoma in situ. Maybe I don't need surgery. So, um, But I think the monoclonal antibodies, so while they were a huge advance, and I was, as a medical student, I worked in a lab developing monoclonal antibodies too, um, they haven't been the cure. Um, I think what's going to be the cure or, the, or bigger huge or impact is the immunotherapies and figuring out how those work in breast cancer um, is the next big you know the next big wave of research I think so they're they're probably going to work mostly for the immunotherapy mostly for triple negative breast cancer so. great well thank you everybody for coming